Well, good morning, everyone, and welcome this morning to our Child Safeguarding and the Law webinar. My name's Mark Roach from the Office of Sport, and we've got a fantastic presentation for you today. Uh, you'll notice that your mics and cameras, apart from our lovely presenters, have been turned off for all attendees. Uh, we ask you not to uh, use reactions, um, but to use your Q&A function if you do have the Q&A function through Teams. But if you don't have Q&A, don't worry, you can put questions through the chat and we've got a team of moderators who will be able to summarise those for our presenter today. Uh, the session will be recorded, so um, we'll be placing a recording of this on our Child Safe Sport webpage on the Office of Sport website. And also we've got a fantastic reference for you to be able to go along with that presentation. I'd like to invite Celia Murphy now, our Executive Director from the Office of Sport, to give our formal welcome. Thanks, Celia. Thanks, Mark. So on behalf of the Chief Executive of the Office of Sport, welcome to the second Office of Sport Child Safe event, Child Safeguarding and the Law. I'd like to open today by acknowledging that we are presenting at Sydney Olympic Park on the lands of the Wongal people of the Eora Nation, the first people and traditional custodians of the land, water and air of this place, and pay respect to elders past, present and emerging, and extend that respect to other Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people wherever you are joining us from. So from the 1st of February 2022, all child related organisations are required to implement the child safe standards throughout their systems, policies and processes. This includes sport and recreation organisations that provide programs or services to children. In New South Wales, the child safe standards are regulated under the Children's Guardian Act. The Office of Sport has worked in collaboration with the Office of the Children's Guardian to develop a raft of support resources, e-learning modules and workshops to raise your awareness and capacity to implement the child safe standards. Following this presentation, I encourage you to reach out to the Office of the Children, Children's Guardian for advice and support re regarding the implementation of the standards. In today's presentation, we will receive an overview of the legal framework that underpins the child safe standards. We will also learn about the additional child safe obligations covering civil liabilities and criminal offences that apply to child related organisations and individuals. With close to 500 registrations for our webinar, this topic is obviously high on everyone's agenda. Our wonderful presenter today is Marco Blanco. Marco is the Principal Solicitor and CEO of Child Safeguard. He is a highly valued member of the Office of Sports Sector Engagement Committee that meets bi-monthly and a director of the New South Wales Aquatic Recreation Institute. Marco has presented at national and state conferences on child safeguarding and child protection. I'm sure you'll enjoy his presentation and the opportunity to ask questions at the end. Lastly from me, thank you for taking the time out of your busy schedules to focus on this important topic. Keeping children safe is at the heart of everything we do and is everyone's responsibility. Thanks, Mark. Thank you, Celia. And now I'd like to welcome Marco to begin his presentation. Thank you, Marco. Thank you, Mark, and um, good morning, everyone. Um, firstly, it's um, it's an absolute pleasure to be with you all this morning. Uh, on behalf of Child Safeguard, we are absolutely thrilled uh, to be collaborating this morning with the Office of Sport in delivering this important webinar on child safeguarding and the law. So um, thank you very much for the introduction. And um, let's get started. So in today's webinar, we're going to provide an overview of the following. I'm going to, um, I'll be giving a brief introduction into um, Child Safeguard. Then we'll um, give some background information. Uh, we're going to briefly touch upon the Royal Commission to understand where have the child safe standards come from. Um, we'll look at the 10 child safe standards. 
we'll look at some recent developments in terms of child protection issues that have been in the media um, that are pertinent or that relate to sports and recreation. We'll look at the regulation of the child safe standards in New South Wales, and then we'll move into child protection law reform. So we're going to give you all a good um, lead in, quite a bit of background information so that you can all understand where it all fits in. Um, we'll be looking at some strategies in terms of how to create a child safe organisation, piecing it all together before we lead into the Q&A. So um, you'll be, I hope you really get a lot out of today. Um, we'll be keeping it pretty general. Um, you know, it is, um, we will be covering some areas um, looking at child protection law reform, but we're going to keep it fairly general and not too technical, um, which is easier for everybody. OK, now it's important for us just to note from the start as a disclaimer, um, we've developed this content for general purposes only. Um, and please note that the information contained in this webinar is true and accurate at the date um, of publication. So child protection laws are evolving and can change. Any change in the circumstances after today, um, such as um, legislation updates, um, may impact the accuracy um, and currency of uh, the content of today's webinar. OK, so that's just important to understand from the start. Now, always, whenever we deliver um, webinars or presentations or deliver workshops, it's always important to note that today's material contains some sensitive content. And therefore, it's important to be aware that um, some of the content may affect victims and survivors of harm and abuse. Um, if you require support, um, please contact um, different support um, groups there, um, and we've outlined a few there for you, being 1800 Respect, Lifeline, and Kids Helpline. Okay, so just a bit of an introduction to Child Safeguard, who we are. Um, we're child safeguarding consultants, trainers, and lawyers. Um, our mission is to make Australian organisations safer for children and young people. Um, our services include um, delivering uh, child safe audits, carrying out reviews of policies and procedures, the delivery of child safe training, both face to face and online, and we also have our child safe certification um, process. So in terms of where the um, child safe standards, the, the development of the child safe standards and where they come from, we have to go back to the Royal Commission. The Royal Commission into institutional responses to child sexual abuse. OK, now the Royal Commission. Um, it was an extremely comprehensive process. It was five years started um, you know, way back in 2013 when Julie Gillard was Prime Minister. We've had a few since then. And it took five, um, as I said, took five years. Now, if we compare that to say the Banking Royal Commission, that was only one year. So it gives you an idea of how comprehensive and forensic the process was. Now, some of the general findings were, organisations fail to prioritise the best interests of children and young people. Organisations lacked adequate child protection policies and procedures. Organisations had poor practices, inadequate governance and inadequate complaints processes. And organisations did not provide adequate child safe education and training for staff and volunteers. Now, um, those were some of the general findings. What's interesting and important to understand is um, what were some of the barriers in place to disclosing abuse? Um, so victims and survivors, um, what were some of the barriers to them in, in disclosing abuse within an organisation? Firstly, simply a fear of not being believed. Secondly, a fear of consequences in small or close-knit communities. 
um, especially in regional rural areas. Feelings of shame and embarrassment, and um, especially when the abuse, um, you know, was perpetrated against young children, um, and uncertainty about what was abusive at the time. So when we look at the key recommendations um, of the Royal Commission, when they handed down their final report in 2017, there were over 400 recommendations. They importantly to understand is that they address all forms of child abuse, not just child sexual abuse. And one of the key recommendations, um, which is, uh, you know, um, one of the important frameworks that we have in place today is the development of the 10 child safe standards. OK, so that gives you a bit of a background in terms of um, the development of the child safe standards, where they came from. And, um, you know, and we're going to talk a bit more about the child safe standards shortly. But what's also important is to understand um, as background information, what do we mean by child abuse and what are the forms of child abuse? So child abuse refers to acts or omissions neglect that result in or have the likelihood to result in harm to a child. The forms of abuse are physical abuse, sexual abuse, and when we refer to child sexual abuse, this includes child grooming, emotional and psychological abuse, and neglect. So those were the four types of abuse that were considered by the Royal Commission. Now, more recently, um, some organisations also refer to a fifth form of abuse being um, exposure to domestic violence. OK, but for the purposes of today's webinar, we'll be referring to the forms of abuse referred to by the Royal Commission. Now, I just wanted to go in a bit more detail in terms of child grooming because this is an important aspect for organisations to understand. Now, what does child grooming mean? Well, the legislation in New South Wales um, says, and um, just for your understanding, the terminology that we've used for today's webinar is general, so it's not e the exact wording um, that is referenced in the legislation, um, but we've made it a bit more concise for today's webinar. An adult, commits an offence if they engage in conduct with the child with the intention of making it easier to procure the child for unlawful sexual activity. Now, specifically in New South Wales, when we talk about conduct, it refers to these three areas. Exposing a child to indecent material, providing a child with an intoxicating substance, or providing a child with any financial or other material benefit. OK, so that's what we mean in New South Wales in terms of child grooming. Now, at the same time, it's really important to understand that child um, that it, there is also an offence um, in terms of grooming a parent, guardian or carer. So grooming refers primarily to when somebody grooms the child, but um, it's also important to understand that perpetrators will seek to groom um, other people close to the child, particular parents or guardians or carers. So in New South Wales, it is also an offence to groom a parent guardian to gain access to the child. OK, so it, that's important to, to understand as well. So what we're going to do with that a bit of background there, we're going to lead into our first scenario. So I'm going to read the scenario here and then um, speak to the, the answer. So I want you to th reflect on as I read through this. A junior sports team coach frequently has long discussions each week at training with the parents of a particular child in their team. The coach has also offered to transport the child to games on the weekend as the parents sometimes have to work. The coach is friends with the child on Facebook 
and often sends private messages to the child via Facebook mess Messenger. OK, so there are a few elements there. Is this an example of possible, possible child grooming behaviour? Yes or no? The answer is yes. Um, and the reason why is that there are a few elements there. OK, now, firstly, we say that um, the sports coach um, has long discussions with the parents of a particular child. Now, that in itself, you know, um, seems quite normal, but it may in the context mean that um, the particular coach is grooming the, the, the parents to gain access to the child. The coach has also offered to transport the child to games. Now, there are some circumstances where this can be, um, where this is in accordance um, with, uh, you know, the member protection policy of, of um, sporting clubs, but it has to be done with complete disclosure um, and consent um, by the parents. So in some circumstances, however, um, the coach should not be a friend um, with the child on Facebook and should not be sending private messages. So this is clearly something that would be against um, a code of conduct and a code of appropriate behaviour. So putting that all together, there are certainly a few red flags there. And that's why child grooming, it's important to understand the full context because it can be difficult to detect. OK, so let's move on to the child safe standards. So I'm going to go over this fairly briefly. Um, the child safe, there's been a, a plethora, you know, a lot of information that the Office of Children's Guardian have been disseminating or providing um, to sports and recreation. So I'm just going to um, speak about this very briefly to also, um, so it gives you a picture of what is the, the whole child safe framework in place. So let's look at the developments of the child safe standards. So as I mentioned before, in 2013, the Royal Commission um, was established. Um, in 2017, the Royal Commission handed down its final report and one of the key recommendations was the implementation of the 10 child safe standards. The 10 child safe standards being regarded as 10 critical elements to embed within an organisation to help create a child safe environment. So it's evidence based. Um, it was uh, comprehensively and forensically researched, and um, this led to one of those key recommendations. In 2019, the national principles were endorsed by the Council of Australian Government, COAG. Now, the importance of that is um, across Australia and you know coming through COVID um, we all understand that states and territories um, have certain powers um, and in terms of child protection and this is where it can get a bit tricky for organizations that have a national presence when it comes to a lot of child protection law it's the state or territory which is responsible for implementing that legislation so in 2019, the national principles were endorsed um, with the view to making the child safe standards or national principles more consistent across the country. And then in New South Wales and this year, importantly, the regulation of the child safe standards in New South Wales commenced um, in, on the 1st of February of this year. And, um, you know, I can commend the Office of Children's Guardian for its role in advocating to government in terms of um, promoting the child safe standards, but ensuring that there's regulation in place. OK, so what are the 10 child safe standards? I'm going to very briefly um, cover this area. So standard one looks at child safety being embedded in organisational leadership, governance and culture. So really think about having a culture of child safety. Standard two, children participate in decisions affecting them and are taken seriously. This is a critical standard. Um, what the Royal Commission found was that abuse took place in organisations and um, part of the reason for that was children were seen but not heard. 
in effect, children had no inputs. They were completely disregarded in terms of how organizations functioned. So it's really important to encourage the participation of children and young people, but also empower them. Um, empower them within your organizations. Standard three, families and communities are informed and involved. Another important, they're all important, but another important sta um, standard there, it's critical that your organization, you're communicating effectively to your key stakeholders, um, children of course being number one, but also families and communities about what, um, how you keep children safe. Standard for equity is upheld and diversity is taken into account. And when you look at diversity, three key groups that the Royal Commission looked at were um, First Nations children, um, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander children, um, looking at cold children, children um, and young people from culturally and linguistically diverse backgrounds, and then children um, with special needs, children with disability. Standard five, people working with children are suitable and supported. OK, so that's important that you've got your proper screening measures in place. We'll touch on, you know, the working with children check is one of those aspects. Standard six, processes to respond to complaints of child abuse are child focused. OK, so, you know, the organisations we work with, it's really important that processes that you have in place um, you know, make sense to a child or a young person. They're not just for staff. Um, standard seven, staff are equipped with the knowledge, skills and awareness to keep children safe through continual education and training. So training. Um, standard eight, risk management, both in the physical and online environments. Standard nine, implementation of the child safe standards is continuously reviewed. And then standard 10, policies and procedures. Okay. OK, so what's important to understand implementing the child safe standards? It's important that child related organizations. So if you deliver a service to a child or young person, um, the legislation refers to you, your organization as child related. Um, it's important to note that when imp that implementing the child safe standards um, to reduce the risks of child abuse occurring. To strengthen your capacity within your organization. So the skills and um, you're, you're increasing the skills um, of, of your staff and volunteers. You're reducing, uh, you know, potential future costs and liability. You're building trust and strengthening relationships with your stakeholders, you know, children, young people, your families, your communities. You're enhancing your brand. And of course, you'll be compliant with government regulation. OK, so that's quite a, a bit of a lengthy background, and it's important that we provide with sufficient background before we go straight into um, the legal obligations. So you understand where it all fits in, you know, the, the whole framework in place. Now, what's also I thought would be really per, um, relevant for today is just to highlight some recent cases that have been in the media. Now, the reason we do this is, you know, it means that some of these matters and we'll get to them child protection issues unfortunately are still happening today okay these are not just historical matters okay unfortunately child protection issues are happening today and that's why it's incumbent on all of you within organizations to remain vigilant um, and to implement child safe environments so recently, just in July, um, a former high school um, teacher based down in the Shire, um, a swim coach, a scout leader has been charged with online, groom online grooming. So he's a former PE teacher um, down in Cronulla. Um, so this, you know, this matter is going before the courts. Um, recently as well, a former scouts leader um, was found to have abused young boys for decades. OK, um, and uh, the the boys were aged between seven and 17. Now, an interesting study um, has found um, this was from the University of Victoria University, but I thought it was important to you know highlight today as well that this recent study, which has only been um, you know released this month, 
found that more than 80% of the respondents across 68 different sports experienced some form of violence in community sport as a child. Incidents of psychological, physical and sexual violence. Um, peers were the most frequent perpetrators of violence um, and more than 80% reported abuse by a coach. So th those figures, you know, are pretty staggering um, and it covers different forms of abuse. But what's interesting, what's important to note as well is that often when we're talking about, you know, child protection issues, often we think about adults on child abuse. What this talks about is, um, you know, the phenomenon of what's referred to as child on child abuse. And I reiterate that third bullet point, peers were the most frequent perpetrators of violence. Um, now we're finding this with our work, especially in school settings, but also in sports and recreation um, of the increase in child on child abuse. So it's important as an organization that um, you're monitoring um, not only the behavior between adults and children, but also amongst children themselves. And remembering that um, often the biggest red flag is bullying um, within an organization, and that can certainly lead to more serious harms of abuse. Um, and I've just noted um, in, in the chat there that the author um, is actually joining us today. Um, so um, thank you for joining us um, and feel free to um, provide any information um, during the Q&A. Um, so that's fantastic to have you with us. Um, number four, um, now this is um, important to note as well. Um, Yeshiva College in Bondi um, has recently, this month again, been found to have failed to comply with its child protection requirements. So it's been non-compliant with working with children check requirements, but it was also found to have provided inadequate child protection training for staff. Now, this relates to education. It's not specifically related to sports and recreation, but the reason why we've inserted it is working with children checks and child protection training are important, okay? Um, this is not something to get complacent about, and it's extremely important that organizations are meeting their requirements. Um, in relation to working with children checks, we're gonna speak about it a bit further on, but also in delivering that child protection training, okay? Don't get complacent about it. It's important, it's critical, and you've gotta keep doing it. And then fifthly, you know, um, this um, case has shocked um, the sports community, a former, um, NRL player um, has pleaded guilty um, to using a carriage service to send child abuse material. Um, a lot of you um, would have heard of this particular player. Um, he's been charged and that's going through the courts as well. So if we can see, we've provided um, five of these examples. Um, and then the sixth one, sorry, I, I forgot about this one, but this is important as well. Um, this will lead into some of the legislation that we'll refer to a bit later on. Last year, um, a woman uh, or um, a 50 year old woman was charged under the new Queensland failure to report laws. So in October of 2021, um, the first person to be charged under those new laws at the time, um, the person failed to report a belief of a child sexual offence being committed against a young girl by another adult. Okay, now this is really important when we look at this in the context of New South Wales, um, in terms of this new failure to report offence, which a lot of people still don't know about, but which is really important. So look, we've covered six areas in, in the media there. What this highlights, firstly, is that child protection is a current and ongoing issue. It's critical that people within organisations remain vigilant and continuously improve. This is not a historical feature, um, unfortunately, um, and it's happening and there are cases on an ongoing basis, okay? So what we've done, we've, um, provided a bit of the background in terms of uh, the development of the child safe standards, where it's come from through the Royal Commission. Um, we've looked at some recent cases in the media. 
Um, we've briefly covered over some areas, the forms of abuse, um, in particular child grooming. Um, what we're going to lead into now very briefly is what does regulation in New South Wales mean of the child safe standards? Um, so in accordance with uh, the Children's Guardian Act uh, 2019, um, regulation of the child safe standards has commenced um, from February of this year in New South Wales. It applies to child related organisations, including sport and recreation organisations, um, and it compels organisations to embed the standards, the child safe standards in systems, policies and processes. Now, the regulator is the, you know, the OCG, the Office of Children's Guardian, um, and um, we have some, uh, you know, um, people representing the Office of Children's Guardian on today. I'm not going to speak um, much about this, but just to highlight the important role that they play here in New South Wales. Um, the Office of Children's Guardian provide um, a plethora of information, of resources um, for all types of organisations um, on. So by all means, um, you know, refer to their website. We're going to give some, we're going to uh, provide you with some links a bit later on, um, but the Officer Children's Guardian, uh, the regulators. Now, most people would know the Officer Children's Guardian um, from their role in terms of, um, you know, uh, regulating the working with children check. Um, they also have this role of now regulating the child safe standards. Now, if we just briefly look at the legislation, so what does the act actually say? Well, it says when it refers to systems, policies and processes that this may include, but it's not limited to the following. OK, so how do organisations embed this? Um, and the legislation says by having a statement of the organization's commitment to child safety, by having a child safe policy, by um, having a code of conduct. Now, when we refer to the code of conduct, the code of conduct refers to employees, okay, staff members, volunteers, um, contractors. So it has a broad application. OK, and also um, it may also identify management as a key group. So it's important to note that the code of conduct has to um, refer to and relate to those different categories. Staff, volunteers, contractors and management can also be regarded as a group. Complaints management policy and procedure, an HR policy um, with with regard to child safe recruitment and induction a risk management plan, and then re reportable conduct policy if applicable. OK, so at this point, I just wanted to acknowledge that the majority of our registrants or participants today will be coming from sporting clubs, OK? But not all of our um, participants um, are coming from sporting clubs today. So what is a... Um, unique feature of sporting clubs is what's referred to as the member protection framework and uh, you know sporting clubs would be aware of that and sporting clubs um, have to comply with the member protection framework from their own sport and so the member protection policy looks to protect members from discrimination harassment abuse and other forms of inappropriate behavior um, the mpio the member Protection Information Officer um, is an important role within an organisation and the MPIO provides guidance on complaints procedures and members rights under the member protection policy. And organisations and clubs and uh, sporting clubs, um, you know, are encouraged and should be promoting and communicating um, your member protection policy and, you know, um, advice communicating who your MPIO is to members, and you can do this through inductions, meetings, training, newsletters, signage, and websites. So there is a lot of information provided by, you know, the Officer Children's Garden, but also the Office of Sport in this area. So I'm just briefly touching on it. So at this point, I know that's a lot of information to digest, um, but at this point, I invite you all to reflect on your organisation, 
Okay, so does your organization have a commitment to child safety? Okay, is that a yes or a no? Um, where is it included? Um, is it um, communicated to all your stakeholders? Um, do children and young people in your organisation know what the commitment to child safety is? Do families know what it is? Do you have a child safe policy? Okay. Do you have a child safe code of conduct? Code of conduct is critical. Okay. And the code of conduct should be um, should be providing clear guidance on what is regarded as appropriate and inappropriate behaviour by an adult um, against a child or young person, okay? Um, and it should be tailored uh, to child safety. A lot of organisations we work with, sometimes they have a code of conduct which covers everything, you know, financial, um, it looks at things like um, how to um, conduct yourself in terms of financial management, um, in terms of, you know, other employee obligations and then also on child safety. Our strong recommendation is that you have a child safe code of conduct, which is um, related specifically to child safety. Do you have a child safe recruitment procedure? OK, it's important that child safety commences right at the start of the recruitment process. So right from the job advertisement. Right from the job advertisement all the way through you know the induction um, through the probation period so that you have clear guidance on how um, new staff and volunteers how they're um, recruited and inducted um, does your organization deliver child safe training to new staff on induction okay another um, extremely important point here um, new staff and volunteers should be receiving induction training on child safety okay and they should be receiving that training before um, they have any contact with children or young people. Okay, does your organization also deliver ongoing refresher child safe training? So this is important. Um, some organizations, you know, that we work with say, well, you know, they've covered induction training um, and then, you know, maybe we need to, we can do refresher training every couple of years. But what's important to know is that, um, in this era of child protection, the legal reforms are happening at such a frequent basis. They're ongoing. And also it's important to know that in this area, it's really important for your staff and volunteers um, to have ongoing training on it, to, you know, to really provide staff and volunteers with confidence to ensure they know what to do um, when they have to respond to a situation. OK, and also noting that induction can be a really overwhelming process, um, you know, for for new people within your organization, because, of course, you're not just looking at child protection, you're looking at, you know, a whole suite of different policies. Um, does your organization have child safety complaints, uh, procedures and systems in place? Um, and do does your organization have risk management processes? So, you know, if you've answered no, to a couple of those or to any of those, it's important that you start the process of becoming compliant um, so that you can ensure that your organization is not just compliant, but ensuring that you're making that you're helping develop a safer environment for children, and young people. OK, so uh, that was quite a lead in um, before we get to, you know, the, the big stuff today in terms of the child protection law reform. But it was really important um, for, for you today to understand the background, where we've come from and where we're going towards, where we're moving towards or where we are now. The child safe standards are really important and provide organisations with the blueprints. OK, but what's important and what we find all the time is that you as an individual, but also the organisation understands that there are additional legal obligations. OK, so what we're going to look at is some criminal offences and civil duties. We're not going to cover absolutely everything today, so we've selected um, some key areas that are important for sports and recreation. OK, so the child in terms of child protection law reform, OK, we'll we'll just reiterate the importance of the working with children check, um, reportable conduct, mandatory reporting, um, 
something that's that's important that a lot of organizations are not aware of in New South Wales, which is the organizational duty to prevent child abuse um, and the failure to report offense and the failure to protect offense. So what's important for participants to understand? It's, you know, it's important not to be overwhelmed by all of this. Um, and a, a, a lot of people within sporting organizations think, geez, we've got a lot to do here, you know, and it can be overwhelming. But think of all of this as a framework, okay? Think of this as a framework and it's complementary. They all complement each other to help create a safer environment. So let's go through it, okay? Um, I'll give an overview of the different areas. Just remember that we're not um, going to be too technical. Um, the language we've used um, is generic in some areas. Um, so we're not going to delve too deep, but we're just going to provide an overview of these key elements. OK, so working with children check, everybody um, knows about this or should know about it. Just to remind you all that it applies to all employees and volunteers, OK, 18 and over, because there is an exemption for anybody under 18 um, in child related roles. Now, what's important and you know what we still do with um, some of our, um, what we still have to stress, the critical area now is for employers and organizations, you must verify the working with children check details of employees and volunteers. Um, unfortunately, this is a step that is that is missed far too often. OK, so it's important that you're verifying um, the working with children check details and Glenn's just inserted the applicable link there. OK, so don't get complacent about this. OK, it's not just um, the new person providing the working with children check clearance. Employers have to verify. OK, and this is another role um, that's um, another um, role that's mandated um, for the Office of Children's Guardian to regulate. OK, reportable conduct. Now, this applies to certain organisations in New South Wales, government agencies. Um, so some of the organisations, there may be some um, individuals um, participating today from local government or faith based or, um, bodies. Um, so those types of organizations, reportable conduct applies to them um, within sports and recreation. And so reportable conduct includes um, sexual offenses, ill treatment, neglect, um, assault, emotional abuse, grooming. Um, so those are key areas that are outlined in the legislation. And it's important with a report, um, important to note that for a reportable allegation, um, that there are requirements to notify the Office of Children's Guardian there. OK, so we're just briefly touching on these areas. Now, of course, um, a lot of people would have heard as well about mandatory reporting. Um, mandatory reporting means um, it applies to certain individuals in certain jobs. Um, it applies to individuals in certain jobs, um, for example, police, teachers or nurses. Um, now, um, mandatory reporters are required to make a report if a child is at risk of significant harm. So people who are mandatory reporters may have um, may be, will be familiar with the term ROSH, risk of significant harm. And the mandatory reporting obligation is to report to community services, um, the Department of Communities and Justice. OK, it used to be facts um, before facts used to be docs some time ago. Um, they've had a few name changes. Now, um, for any of you that want further guidance on this, I strongly recommend that you can refer to the MRG online. OK, the Mandatory Reporters Guide and the MRG enables you um, to uh, follow through a decision tree um, process. If you've got a concern and you're unsure, um, you can then um, generate a PDF and it can provide you with guidance on what are the next steps to do. So it's a fantastic resource in terms of mandatory reporting there. OK, now this is something that a lot of organisations are not aware of, um, but following another recommendation from the Royal Commission, it's important to note that organisations themselves have additional obligations. And one of those um, 
a civil obligation is uh, the organizational duty to prevent child abuse. So essentially an organization has uh, um, this duty if they have a responsibility um, for a child, um, they must take reasonable precautions to prevent an individual associated with that organization from perpetrating child abuse against a child who was under the organization's responsibility. OK, now at this point, we haven't included much information about the legislation, where it comes from. The reason for that is, um, and Mark will speak a bit about this later on, is that we've also prepared a fact sheet that will be uploaded to the um, officers, Officer Sports Child Safety and Sport website. Um, and on the fact sheet, we provide more detailed information about the legislation and different and refer and provide links to different resources that you can read um, um, in your own time after the after the webinar as well. Um, so we're keeping it fairly simple, OK, in terms of um, the content that we have here. So what's important to understand is from the Royal Commission, there have been ongoing reforms that have created additional obligations for organizations, but also for individuals. OK, and one of these is the duty to prevent child abuse. Now, the the Royal Commission was um, through its research, it found that organizations failed miserably. You know, incredible failure right across the board in terms of protecting children. So it's incumbent on um, the government to impose more obligations on organizations to better protect children. OK, so there have been ongoing reforms in that regard. Now, there are two important offences here that we want to um, take you through. And then what we're going to look, we're going to look at a couple of scenarios. OK, so I know it's a lot to take in, but we're covering them and then we'll have time to digest it. The failure to report offence. OK, so this is a relatively new offence um, in New South Wales. It's also in other parts of the country. Um, in Victoria, and it's important for um, everybody today to understand because what it says is um, the legislation refers to an adult who commits a criminal offence if, firstly, they know, believe, or reasonably ought to know that a child abuse offence has been committed against a child under 18. Okay. Secondly, they fail to make a report to the police without a reasonable excuse. So this is a criminal offence, OK? And there is a maximum penalty there for imprisonment for five years. So this is serious. Now, a, you know, a few things to note here. Now, I'm not sure if um, any of you today have noticed this, but it says an adult, OK, an adult. This applies to all adults across the state, OK? Now, this is a huge development. Traditionally, um, in terms of any type of criminal offence, you know, that would have been um, imposed on, say, um, the director of the agency, the, the principal, you know, of, of a school or the director of an organisation. What the Royal Commission has purposely advised and recommended is that there has to be this widening of responsibility to cover um, all staff um, or volunteers within an organization. But this goes further. This applies to all adults. OK, so this is a has a broad application. Um, and what it means is that all adults have this responsibility now. So no longer can um, individuals say, well, it's not my responsibility. I'm not the director. Um, I'm not the boss. I'm not the manager. This applies to everybody who's an adult within your organization. OK, um, and secondly, the failure to protect defense. And what this says is that an adult working in a child related organization. OK, so the failure to protect specifically um, makes a connection with the organization. An adult working in a child related organization commits an offense if they know of a serious risk that another adult in the organization will commit a child abuse offense against a child who is under the care supervision or authority of that organization. Secondly, they have the power or responsibility 
to reduce or remove the risk. Thirdly, they negligently fail to reduce or remove the risk. OK, and also it's a criminal offence. There is a, a penalty and um, the maximum penalty is imprisonment for two years. So what we have here are two offences, the failure to report and the failure to protect. What they do in combination is they impose and they really spread out responsibilities um, for staff and volunteers within organisations that have that have an obligation to make a report to the police um, in the circumstances um, outlined, but also to protect children, to take action, to um, help prevent um, abuse, okay, um, against children and young people. Now, I can be pretty blunt here. Um, with, with some of the uh, presentations that we've delivered or workshops, people get a bit, um, sometimes people can get a bit frightened here when we start talking about criminal legislation, okay? And yeah, I can, I, I certainly appreciate that. But what's clear is that organisations have to do better, not just organisations, individuals within organisations, okay? And what these two offences do is broaden that responsibility um, we all have shared responsibility in organisations because remember child protection is everyone's business. OK, there's no more shifting. Um, there's no more hiding. Um, every adult within an organisation has legal obligations to make a report in certain circumstances and to also prevent harm. OK. So um, just to kind of wrap that component up because there was a lot there and I appreciate that. So how does this all fit in? How do these criminal offences and civil duties impact your child safety obligations? Well, they all work, um, they all complement each other, okay? And what I want you to think of is a framework, a child protection framework with different elements and what they do is they all aim to help create a safer environment for children and young people. So all child related organisations and its staff and volunteers have child safety obligations. That's clear. And these obligations, so these criminal offences, which we which I outlined, failure to report, uh, failure to protect, these are separate to and in addition to existing mandatory reporting obligations. OK, so um, it can be a challenge, it can be tricky, it can be a bit complex to understand all these obligations. Um, but what's simple and what's clearly understood is that all adults, staff and volunteers have legal obligations, okay? Um, and the organisation itself has obligations as well. Now, we're going to talk a bit more about strategies a bit later on, okay? Um, so don't get too overwhelmed by that all. Um, the, there are there are strong reasons why these laws have come into place um, and organisations have nothing to fear moving forward because the blueprint is clear, okay? Um, the child safe standards, the blueprint is clear in terms of helping to create those child safe environments. Okay, so let's look at a couple more scenarios. So, an AFL club manager overheard a player telling their friend at training that one of the coaches at the club sent them a nude picture. Okay. The club manager ignored what they heard because, you know, they're good friends with the coach. They don't want to cause any issues. The club and the club manager have failed to meet their obligations in accordance with which of the following two areas of New South Wales legislation. Okay. Um, a, organisational duty to prevent child abuse. B, working with children check. Or C, failure to protect. So I just want you to reflect on that, okay? So the issue here in this particular scenario is that a manager, somebody, you know, with authority within the organisation has overheard, um, you know, one of the players, um, we say a child here, um, speaking to one of their friends and telling them that one of the coaches has sent them a nude picture. Okay, um, this is clearly against any code of conduct and clearly inappropriate. Um, the club manager has ignored um, this 
uh, because they're good friends with the coach. Now, we, we've been involved with um, particular um, incidents uh, from organizations where this situation has taken place, okay? So the two applicable answers are, A, organizational duty to prevent child abuse. So what we heard before, the organization um, has or, um, an obligation, you know, to people within the organization um, to prevent uh, abuse taking place, okay? And a failure to protect. So, you know, the organizational duty to prevent child abuse refers to, um, you know, the obligations, the civil obligations imposed on an organization itself. Uh, and then the failure to protect offense refers to the obligation, is a criminal offense, which refers to um, the individual obligation there. Okay. Uh, next one a touch football. Um, coach becomes aware that one of the players is experiencing child abuse at home. OK, um, and, and look, coaches, people within sporting clubs are often. Um, you know, they're, they're often people that children and young people look up to, you know, um, we, Australia is um, unashamedly um, a sport loving country. And children and young people um, can experience their best times growing up, being part of a sporting club. That's why it's so important that Sports and Rec really um, appreciate their responsibility because, you know, um, often children and young people who are having a tough time don't have a safe environment at home. Um, the sporting club can be, you know, their outlet where they get to have fun with their friends. Um, they get to, you know, that that outlet away from an unsafe environment at home. So it makes it even um, more important that the sporting environments are safe, a safe environments for children and young people. Um, so just getting back to this again, let me, I'm just going to read the scenario again. A touch football coach becomes aware that one of the players is experiencing child abuse at home. So it doesn't relate to the organization, okay? Um, it relates to something that's happening at home, and this can this um, can happen. You know, um, children, young people will be disclosing things to to coaches or people at the sporting club, um, especially kids that find it tough at home, or they find out information. So, the coach is required to report to police under which area of New South Wales criminal law? A. Work health and safety. B. Failure to report. C, the child safe standards. OK, so from what we've just gone through with the criminal offences, we now understand that all adults, all adults um, have an obligation to make a report to the police. OK, so in this particular scenario, now we haven't given, you know, a lot of detail here. It's just a general scenario. Um, but in this situation, it's important that, um, you know, you understand that if you're aware of something happening at home, you still have obligations. OK, because failure to report is a broad obligation. OK. OK, then, so um, we've covered a lot so far. OK, we've covered a lot in the background. We've looked at some of the legal reforms um, and some of these new reforms that some of you probably aren't aware of or don't know much about. So it may be a bit daunting um, or you may, you know, be a bit anxious, but let's Let's keep positive about this. You know, these are measures that are purposely in place to create safer environments. Um, so what are some strategies to create a child safe organization? So let's establish a clear commitment to child safety. OK, and let's make sure that that is uh, communicated to all stakeholders. Uh, let's promote, a f um, we've got facility wide, but we mean organizational wide culture of child safety. OK, child safety cuts across the whole organisation. We now know if you if we didn't um, realise that child protection is everyone's business, all adults, OK, um, staff and volunteers have those obligations. Um, you know, we strongly recommend that organisations appoint a child safety champion or child safety officer, you know, a key person, a key contact person within your organisation or in a sporting club, you know, the MPIO so that um, your stakeholders, children, young people, um, families, parents, guardians, carers, they know who to speak to 
if they have a concern, if they want further information, if they need to make a complaint. OK, develop um, a child safe policy framework, which is aligned with the child safe standards. Look, the child safe standards are 10 critical steps and it's your blueprint. It's your blueprint for creating a safe environment for children. OK, um, now if you know you haven't quite got there, um, if you haven't developed those, put in place your implementation plan and start working through those. Um, it's important to note that you have those legal obligations now. Um, so if they're not all in place, you've got to get cracking to start working on implementing those. And communicate with children about safety at your organisation. OK, um, further strategies. Deliver, we reinforce this point all the time, deliver induction and ongoing child safety training to staff. Um, implement comprehensive risk management strategies. Communicate with families about your child safety approach. Families should, um, they should have access to what, you know, all your child safety um, policies, procedures that relate to them and children. Um, they should be receiving this um, from the first point of their involvement, of their child's involvement with your organisation. A fantastic way of doing this is developing a child safe handbook um, that all families, um, parents, carers, children, young people receive from their first point of, you know, of entry with your organisation. Make it accessible on your website, okay? Um, ensure that complaints processes are understood by children and families. OK, so a complaints process for child safety is not directed to staff only, to staff and volunteers. OK, it's got to be accessible to all stakeholders. And it's important to continuously review and improve your practices. So, you know, when we were working with organisations some time ago, say, you know, more than five years ago, organisations would be obsessing and agonising over getting the policies right you know, spending months and months on getting the policy perfected. And then you kind of have this natural kind of, um, how can I say, you get all that work done with the policy itself, then you sit back, you're relieved, um, you know, and then you don't look at it, it's put on the shelf, and then you go back to it in a couple of years. Our, our strong recommendation is that you look at it as, you know, a living, a living plant, that you've got to keep watering the policy. You've got to keep giving it life because this is a dynamic area where child protection policies, uh, sorry, laws have been updated regularly and they will keep being updated for, you know, the next five or so years because we're experiencing a child protection revolution in Australia. OK, what that means is that you've got to look at having um, a policy framework and look, this is a bit um, different in terms of sporting clubs because you've got, you know, your member protection policy and it's very hierarchical from, you know, the national sporting um, organisation down to the SSO, the state sporting or down to the local club. I understand that. But in terms of organisations, it's important that you're updating it and that people within your your club, your organisation, um, are not just adopting a generic template. You've got to own it. You've got to understand it. OK, you've got to revisit it. You've got to keep looking at it and keep updating it. OK, so, um, you know, we've got some links to some resources there. Um, the Australian Human Rights Commission, um, they provide, you know, they've developed um, some fantastic resources on child safety. Um, Department of Families and Justice, of course, providing information about mandatory reporting. Um, as I said, I strongly recommend that you refer to the MRG if you are a mandatory reporter. Um, the Officer Children's Guardian. OK, the Officer Children's Guardian have a suite. You know, they've been working so much the last few years in terms of developing resources for this sector as well um, in collaboration with the Officer Sport. And then, of course, played by the rules if that if that applies to your sporting club. Now, we've just provided some links here. Um, as Glenn's been noting in the chat, um, registrants will have access to this recording. Um, you know, um, once that's uploaded in a few days, um, Mark will speak to uh, a bit about that towards the end. But also, um, we've developed a fact sheet to provide, um, you know, more links to um, for people. Uh, so, 
Today's webinar works in um, conjunction with the fact sheet. Um, so you've got the PowerPoint, the recording, um, the fact sheet to help you, you know, as you digest um, the information from today to then refer to some links if you want to get further information. So look, thank you very much um, for your attendance today. Um, it's been uh, my absolute pleasure to present today. Um, I know it's a lot to take in, um, but you know, be assured, be confident that um, you know there are strategies in place that you can start implementing to help making a child safe organization. As we outline, the child safe standards are your blueprint. Okay, and now we're going to move to Q and A. We've got some great questions for you, Marco, in the Q&A uh, app. So if you'd like to open up some of those again, if people, if attendees don't have access to that Q&A functionality through Teams, that's OK. You can put your question through the chat, um, which if everyone definitely will have that and we can transfer it to the Q&A. If possible, we can get to most of these questions uh, from now until when we wrap up at 11.30. You right to go, Marco? OK, yeah, so thanks for that, Mark. Um, thanks again, everybody. Um, let's. Let's attack some of these questions. OK, so. Um, I've got a few coming through. Let me just um, I'll just track back to. OK, let me just go back here. Um, OK, one second, I'm just digesting a few of these questions and then we'll get we'll get going. So we've got um, one um, question here um, from um, can't see the person's name. It's been anonymous uh, anonymously um, upload, which is completely fine. Um, I'm going to read the question and then I'll respond. If a national sporting organisation is running out of uh, New South Wales, um, although has a state sporting body also within New South Wales, does the NSO have to ensure they are abiding by all standards despite not having direct contact with children? Or is this the SSO responsibility? I'm mindful that um, the, national, the NSO often have to be broad enough to co cover all state jurisdictions. OK, so look, I'm just going to respond pretty generally in relation to this. Um, for sporting clubs, you know, the. The member protection framework has been in place for geez, uh, a long time, you know, a long time, over 15 years and the historical development of this has been that, you know, um, before Sport Australia, the Australian Sports Commission um, and, you know, national NSOs uh, to receive funding from the Australian government had to comply um, with uh, member protection, the member protection framework. And within that framework, child safeguarding was one of those areas. So within sports, you very much have this hierarchical approach where the NSO um, has to comply um, with its obligations to the Australian government. Um, and then they you know, develop um, a policy framework in line with the member protection um, framework. And then that cascades down to the state, to the, you know, to the regional, to the local club. Um, so in relation to the nexus, the relationship between the National Sporting Organization, the SSO, that kind of membership um, relationship is really something that those organizations have to work uh, very closely um, on to ensure that there is proper alignment. So the NSO will be looking at, you know, the, the laws in place or the member protection framework in terms of child safeguarding relates to, has information that covers Australia, so all states and territories. OK, um, it is a challenge for national bodies to keep abreast of the developments in each state and territory, um, but the the member protection framework is certainly updated to reflect that. 
However, um, I can appreciate that, you know, the SSO, the state body will have certain expertise um, in understanding their own jurisdiction or which state or territory they come from. So my recommendation is that you work closely together. The SSO will have obligations that they have to meet, membership obligations to the NSO. Um, but what's also important to understand within sport is that clubs have their own obligations. OK, and this is the tricky part for sports. You can't just adopt a framework and think, um, you know, as a local club, we're not responsible. The NSO is responsible. As we've seen, individuals within your organisation are responsible for protecting children. So there's a, a big sense of shared responsibility. So that responsibility doesn't diminish um, as it cascades down, you know, from the national to the state to the local club. Um, it's present here in New South Wales. Um, my recommendation here, if I can just final, uh, make a final comment there, is um, it's important for the NSOs and SSOs to be communicating very closely in that regard. OK. I hope that kind of covers it there. Um, let's go to... OK, so I've got a, a question from Alison Cheryl um, that Glenn's put in. If you have a child at your club whose parents aren't very involved in the club, can you contact the child via a chat group with multiple members, um, a team chat with other parents and children? Um, hi, Alison. Look, thanks for that question. And it's a really um, relevant, pertinent question because, you know, with a lot of our clients, we understand the the challenges in engaging with, you know, some of your members, um, children, young people in terms of training or, you know, scheduling when games are on, um, if it's difficult to engage with parents. What I'd say here is that it's important to look at the policy framework from your sport. OK, as so a starting point, you need to understand what your sport says, OK, whether it's cricket, whether it's football, um, you know, whether it's rugby league, AFL, etc. Um, in terms of this approach, um, it's important that there is transparency. There is absolute transparency in terms of authorised communications. What you want to avoid is non-transparent private conversations between adults and children. OK, now um, in this circumstance, you know, I know that some organisations have a strict approach and they say adults cannot communicate with children. They have to communicate with parents and families. OK, um, now if that's the case, you have to abide by that. Some all the other organisations take um, a bit more of a broader approach where in terms of communications, there has to be um, transparency and informed consent. Um, but in this situation, because it is a sensitive area, because we have seen, um, you know, cases of child grooming, uh, many sports have um, have um, categorised communications with children, even if it's part of a forum like this, as um, an unacceptable or inappropriate form of communication. Um, so. I guess to go back to that, Alison, it's important to understand what's the position from your sport so you can play from a membership perspective. If if you do implement something, you have to look at the risk management approach. OK, so if um, you're communicating in this type of forum, it's important to understand, OK, what are the risks? What could happen? How do we mitigate those risks? How we do we ensure that children and young people um, aren't going to be groomed? aren't going to be exposed to inappropriate um, contact, et cetera. So as a minimum, you should have a risk management assessment to ensure that um, you're not just communicating in this type of forum if the parents are, are non-responsive. Um, OK, I think I'll leave it there. Um, next one. Um, OK, there's another comment here. It's very hard to find resources for and to develop a risk management plan or annual assessments. How would you suggest we work on these? OK, this has been a comment that's been inserted uh, from an anonymous um, person. Completely fine. Um, OK. 
In terms of risk management, the Office of Children's Garden have a lot of resources um, and are providing ongoing resources. And um, I think, you know, we've got Mark Lorenti who's on board today. Um, g'day, Mark, from the Office of Children's Guardian. Um, but Glenn will be provide, you know, may provide some of that information. Um, I see that we've just inserted Mark's contact details there. So in terms of what the Office of Children's Guardian can provide, um, they've got a lot of resources there, so feel free to get in touch with Mark there or Hi, go Marco. to their website. Marco, it's Mia. Um, yes, we, Mia. We, we also have a new resource coming out specifically for sport and recreation that we're developing with the Children's Guardian on risk management. So there will be an online training session plus with, that has really good information about how to build a risk management plan for a, a club level organisation. So it's just in the final stages of production. So that's going to be coming out very shortly. Just to let you know. Yeah, um, thanks for that, um, Mia. Look, I just note that. Um, yeah, Mark's made a comment there as well, and I completely agree. It's everybody's responsibility. Um, so take note of those resources that will be coming out. Now, in terms of risk management, let me say this. This, depending on what type of organization you're in, some organizations um, are very um, are very accustomed to carrying out risk assessments um, on a regular basis or carry out risk assessments prior to programs uh, or with high frequency. And I can, you know, I can appreciate, I've said that a few times today, that that can be um, a bit challenging if, you know, you're in a sporting club or in an organisation where, you know, you're re really dependent on volunteers um, who may not have um, that, you know, that experience in terms of implementing risk management frameworks. Um, what I would suggest as a starting point, if you're starting from scratch, OK, um, refer to the resources from the OCG. Keep your eyes open for those future resources from the Office of Sport and OCG. Um, but really simplify it. Um, go back, think of, let's look at an example. OK, um, let's look at um, an area in terms of risk management which we often find is an area that um, that needs to be that needs to be looked at is within a facility um, are hidden spaces or obscured areas within a, within a facility. Now that can be inside the facility or outside of the facility. OK, um, there may be some, you know, might be a clubhouse, a sporting clubhouse, it may be um, a rural, you know, aquatic venue. Um, in terms of carrying out a risk assessment, I think it's important that you do it as a team or you get key stakeholders within the organization that are able to put in their inputs. OK, you identify as a team, what are the risks? Or what are the possible risks? OK, so you carry out this process where you're identifying possible risks um, that could take place within your facility. Um, and one of those things is ensuring that there are no hidden or concealed areas um, where children and young people could be, um, you know, where harm could take place against a child or young person um, with little or no supervision. OK, um, so this is kind of one area. So with the risk assessment template and then what you do is you go through this step of identifying the possible risks um, and then you're looking at how to minimize those risks. What measures could you put in place? OK, um, so if it's a hidden area, you could block it off. Um, if it's a hidden area, um, you could implement, you know, random checks or regular checks throughout the day to make sure that that area is not exposed. Um, now, depending on the organization, you could um, install CCTV surveillance. So that would have to be done in accordance, you know, with, with the organization um, and in a safe manner as well. Um, you could highlight um, that these are areas um, that are prohibited. So there are many things that you can do um, to address this risk, okay? And normally you would do that through a risk template process itself. So um, I, I know that risk management itself can sometimes be tech, seem technical. It can be a bit daunting if you don't have experience in this. My suggestion, like with anything new, is have a crack, have a go. Um, the more you do it, um, the better you get, the more you understand it. Um, defer, refer to the resources that are available. 
Um, but importantly, make sure you're involving your team because it's not something that one person should be doing by themselves. OK, I hope that's kind of covered that one. Let me look at a couple of others. OK, um, we've got a question from Turia Vogel. Um, are there templates um, available for recruitment? OK, so. Um, it, again, the Officer Children's Guardian have a lot of resources that cover um, each of the standards and in particular, um, you know, what's important. Now, in terms of re recruitment, let me just make some general observations. OK, and Glenn's just inserted um, a link there, but let me to, let me just briefly um, address your question there and then, um, you know, um, the OCG or um, somebody um, may wish to um, provide you with a bit more information. In terms of recruitment, it's important to think of the whole recruitment and induction process. Um, now, most individuals and organisations understand very well, OK, we need a working with children check. OK, but what's important, as I mentioned in the presentation, um, the individual's got to get the clearance, but the employer, OK, or the organisation needs to verify it. Now, if you don't verify it, um, then the Officer Children's Guardian cannot make that link between the individual and that organisation, OK? Um, if if you know something happens now, I'll tell you. I'll give you an example. Um, one of our clients um, had um, was one of our clients was contacted by the OCG, advising that um, a working with children check clearance had been revoked and that a person had been barred. Okay, meaning that their working with children check clearance had you know been taken away. Um, however, the organisation itself um, hadn't had any relationship with that particular person for something like three years. But what had happened was that um, our client, <laughs> a good clients, um, they complied with the validation and the verification process. But then after that particular staff member left that organisation and went to work in other organisations, those organisations failed to verify the working with children check. Um, and then that individual um, was, you know, was lost in the system a bit. So it's important that you're verifying. That's really important. OK, so I cover that. So in terms of working with children check, OK, that's an easy first step. But the working with children check is an important but not the only requirement. OK, so you've got to think about the very first job advertisement. OK, when you're seeking to employ somebody or get new volunteers, you should be mentioning or highlighting our organization is a child safe and um, organization. Um, we and and then perhaps, you know, um, including information around your child safety statement and then in the interview process. OK, um, you should be asking value based questions to determine whether that person is appropriate to work with children. OK, so you start with the job advertisement. You then go to the, the interview process or the application process. Um, and then when that person um, is employed or brought on as a volunteer, they've got to go through that induction process, OK? And they should be receiving um, uh, training on child safety, you know, whether it's online or face to face. Um, but then it keeps going, OK? The person should be monitored during the probation period. So thinking of recruitment as, you know, this process, not just the, um, you know, getting somebody to fill the job and then it finishes. Now, in terms of templates, um, you know, again, I'd refer you to the Officer Children's Guardian to get more information about that. OK, now we've um, we've got time probably for one or two more. Let me um, apologize. I'm just not going to be able to cover everything here. Um, OK, so I've got a question here um, from Louise Cook, who's um, stated. Thanks for your question, Louise. Um, I assume there is no responsibility on organisations to highlight, promote mandatory reporting. 
there would be strategies across those professions to ensure that those in the scope of this are aware of the requirements. OK, so. Um, in sports, um, so look, the benefits of these new offences, and really this is a benefit from a child focused perspective. The benefit of the failure to report, failure to protect is that it enhances and broadens the scope of responsibility. For a long time, and you know, this is, you know, um, an unintended consequence in a way, because mandatory reporting didn't cover all professions. You know, it covers you know, police officers, nurses, teachers, and set professions. It means that if you aren't one of these categories, um, sometimes there was a sense that, look, it's not my obligation to do this. OK, and it created this kind of different tier between an organization that has these responsibilities and a lower tier, including most sports organizations that would not be regarded as a mandatory reporter. Um, so, Louise, if your organization um, or if individuals within your organization are not regarded as man mandatory reporters, OK, then yes, it may, um, those organizations don't have those obligations in terms of promoting mandatory reporting. Um, but as we now know, all organizations have responsibilities um, to train their staff and volunteers on their obligations in accordance with failure to report, failure to protect offences. 